I cannot see your face, mother. Yes? I can't see your face. You can't see my face? Oh, well, now I can see. Uh, at that time, I was seeing the ceiling. Oh. Okay. The software I'm using does not allow you to see my face at the moment. But then when mm -hmm. we're through, uh, you will be able to see me. I'll, I'll, I'll disable it so that you can actually see me. Like at the beginning, you could see me, right? Okay. Martha, okay. at the beginning, you could see me, yes or no? Mm -hmm. I'm saying at the beginning, could you see me or you could not see me? The first time I logged in. I could see you. Right, because at that time I was not using the software I'm using right now. So the software does not allow me to, to be seen, but at least you can hear me. Yeah. So when we are through, I'm going to disable it and then you'll still be able to see me. Okay? Okay. Okay. So right now we're going to get started. It is 21 minutes past two. I don't know where the noise is coming from. I'm in a quiet place. I don't know. Oh, I'm actually near the road. Oh, that that's is why. why. It's okay then. Because that's yeah. something we can't do anything about. So I'm presenting the work right now. I'm sharing my screen with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, our lesson for today is the revision of the Form 1 work you did, since you're the only student who did it. Uh, according to the time we agreed, I know it's a public holiday, but this is the time we agreed upon, which you're available, and that is why it's happening now. So, the objectives... The objective of the lesson is that by the end of the lesson, you should be able to solve numerical problems on manometer, meaning any calculation on manometer, you should be able to solve the calculation on manometer pressure. Manometers are the YouTubes, if you remember. Are they? YouTube. YouTube. A manometer is a YouTube. Oh, yeah. You remember the YouTubes. You'll see one if you've forgotten how yes. it looks like. Then, we are going to determine resultant vector of forces. We're going to determine resultant vectors. Then, we are going to have a look at charging, or rather the effect of charges on an electroscope, and then a charged balloon. Then, lastly, we're going to look at the concept of rotating mi mirrors at an angle. Did you capture everything, what you're seeing on your screen? Yeah. I really hope this works, because with the noise, I don't know if you, you, you get everything I'm saying. Or... Yeah, I can hear you. You can hear me. Okay, let's do this. Let's do this. Uh, if you mute your mic, you won't be able to talk. But when you hear me ask you to, to, to talk, you unmute your mic. Is that better? Okay. okay. So for now, just mute your mic. Because at the beginning, we needed to, to communicate continuously. I needed to, to know whether you can hear me. But for now, you only talk when I ask you to talk. So for now, mute your mic. Okay, if there is anything that I'm saying and you cannot hear me clearly, feel free to unmute your mic, then you talk. So the first thing we're going to look at is the YouTube or the manometer pressure. 
at least when there's silence, you'll be able to hear everything I say. And when there's something you've not captured, you're free to unmute and then I can hear what you have to say. Even when I'm explaining something in a diagram and you need to talk, feel free to unmute. Do not delay. There could be background noise, but we're trying to work with the situation as it is. Right. So the concepts are going to capture, we, we have pressure, force, electrostatics, light. These are form one topics. Then we have uh, the introduction, where uh, we are going to look at the summary of the performance in the form one work, which was not very good. But at least you tried. One thing is you're the only student who did it, and you're not the only Form 4 student there. It was Adam. But maybe due to one thing or other, he could not do the work. Our first activity, we're going to look at uh, manometers, then the resultant vectors, because the first question was actually manometers. So in my order, I started with resultant vectors. According to the way the topics are arranged in Form 1, it's faster force than pressure. Then, we are going to look at the mistakes you made, discuss the correct approach. Then I'll give you a question to try to test your understanding. I repeat, we're going to look at the mistakes you made. We'll look at the way forward, how it should have been done. Then, I give you a question to try and check your understanding. Then our second activity, we're going to, after manometers that is, before we go to activity two, we're going to do the same with resultant vectors. So manometers and resultant vectors, we'll check your errors, discuss about them, do some questions to check understanding. The second activity, we're going to look at how the electroscope is affected by charge. When a body has some charge and is brought close to the electroscope, how is it going to behave? In this case, the electroscope already has some charge. Then we're also going to look at charges on a balloon under the same topic of electrostatics. So mainly we're just in the same topic here, electrostatics one. We study the effect of charges on an electroscope, which is charged, and a balloon. Then the third activity, we are going to look at the topic light. The specific area is application of rotating mirrors at an angle. This was usually done in the lab. However, you can have theory questions about it. So we're going to look at how you should have solved the question. We're going to look at recommendations and perhaps an example to practice within the lesson. Then lastly, we're going to summarize the key points, what we've learned today under pressure, distribution of charges as well. So starting with the first part, which is manometers, because it's the first question on the paper. We have the YouTube. The YouTube is the part where you're seeing my cursor is moving. On, from the left-hand side, we have mercury, 60 millimeters. Then on the right-hand side, we have a gas chamber. The question is a little bit confusing, which can happen also in KCSC questions, where sometimes the data given is contrary to what the diagram reveals. With the units, sometimes there's a little bit of a confusion. However, I was giving an allowance for calculating using either units. In this case, the question says the figure below shows a YouTube manometer containing oil of density 0 0.9. So the density of oil is already given as 0 0.9 grams per cubic centimeters. Then one end is connected to a gas tap. And they're asking if atmospheric pressure is 1 times 10 power 5 pascal, find the pressure of the gas. Now, the 
oil from the diagram, it's indicating it's actually mercury on that side that we're having. And then the oil is only to that level, though they drew the dashes to mean the upper part could very well be oil. But since the area of concern is this height, so I was giving preference to mercury. Though, if you'd actually use the oil's density, I would give you marks, because what I was majorly testing here is understanding of the concept and knowing what to do. Now, we will discuss the approach, then I will ask you what mistake you made. So, the main idea that is usually used in these kinds of questions is that we have mercury on one side to a certain level and the gas on the other side, the right hand side, to a certain level. Notice that the dotted lines the dotted line is right here where you can actually see where the mercury height ends and the height of the gas also ends, meaning the level is the same. So you look for the point where the two substances are having the same level. Once you identify that point, it means now the pressure exerted at that level must be equal. So the pressure on the left hand side where we have mercury column to that level is equal to the pressure on the right hand side where we have the column of gas to the same level. So if the pressures are the same at that level, then we apply the formula that the gas pressure which is on the right hand side, must be equal to the pressure on the left hand side. And it's pressure due to two things. Why am I saying two things? Because on the left hand side, we have mercury, yes, but above mercury, we have an open column, which has atmospheric pressure. So, the pressure on the left hand side is due to everything above that level. The pressure on the left hand side is as a result sorry, of everything above that level. So we've got mercury acting together with atmospheric pressure. So the formula, when you go back to it, we've got gas pressure equals atmospheric pressure plus pressure due to the mercury column. Then, how do we simplify that further? The pressure due to the gas is unknown. It remains a blank on this side. The atmospheric pressure is given us 1 times 10 power 5. It comes here as pressure due to the atmosphere, then plus the pressure due to the mercury column. And pressure due to mercury is given as rho hg, the density times the height in meters times the gravitational constant, which is 10 for high school. Why are we using rho hg? Is because mercury is a liquid, and this is the formula for pressure of fluids, meaning either a liquid or a gas. Now, using the numbers, we have 1 times 10 power 5 plus the density of mercury in SI units is 13600 times the height 60 millimeters of mercury. In meters, you have to divide by a thousand, because a thousand millimeters make one meter. So we divide by a thousand and get 0 0.06. Then we multiply by the gravitational constant and arrive at our answer here, which is 108,000 
and 160. Any questions so far, Martha? Hello, Martha, can you hear me? Yes, no question. Have you understood? Yeah. That this is the, is the winning formula, that the pressure at the same level is equal. And then the second point is you must consider, you must consider all the substances above that level. Now, I have a, a question for you. Question number one. Just mute before your mic. That question. Oh, before that question, yeah, speak. If, if the height of the gas and that of the mercury are not of the same size, mm -hmm. what will be the formula? If the height of the gas and the mercury are not of the same size. For example, mercury went higher. Mm -hmm. then the formula remains the same because what we're looking at is the level you see that where the dotted line is yeah the lowest point where where mercury is and where the gas also is you cannot go beyond the point where the gas is or beyond the point where mercury is. It's a level that is common for both of them. Because in in fluids, in fluids we speak of pressure being affected by depth. The pressure depends on depth. You can mute, then you listen, then uh, you unmute to ask me any question you have. That way you can hear everything I say and everything you say. Okay, Martha. Oh, so you see, it's not the it's not the vertical height that worries us in this question. We must look for a point where the gas, for example, in this case, we have the gas going all the way down to that level. After the gas comes the oil. So right before the oil, at the boundary between the gas and the oil. That is the point we are checking because we'll no longer be having gas if we keep going down. So that is the end point of the gas. The depth of the gas ends at that point where we're having the boundary between the oil and the gas. So once we see that point, we go to the other side where there is mercury and draw a dotted line. Sometimes the line is drawn for you. Sometimes it's never there. So the dotted line here is determined by the gas, what level it had reached, what boundary it had. So the boundary between the gas and the oil is where now the line begins, running all the way to the other side of mercury. That is the common level. So from that point, then everything above, the level on the left-hand side gives us the pressure. And on the right hand side, everything above that level gives us the pressure, which makes the pressure on the left hand side to now be equal to the pressure on the right hand side. That was a very good question, Martha. Ask if you've not understood. Hello? Yes, I'm okay. You're okay. Okay, so my question yeah. to you, question number one says, if the gas tube was on the other side, that is now the left, it's no longer here, it goes to the left, and the mercury column is now on the right-hand side, what would be the value of the gas pressure? If the gas is on the left and the mercury is now on the right, what would be the value of the gas pressure? What do you think? Maintaining the same diagram, only flipping sides, changing the side of the gas, taking it to the left, and then flipping the side of the mercury, bring it to the right. 
what would be the value of the gas pressure? I think the gas pressure will just be the same. That's excellent. You're right. The gas pressure is going to remain the same. The same. Why is that? Because nothing changes. That's also an excellent answer because nothing changed. Changes. Now to the second question. What mistake did you make when you were calculating this? Because you didn't do this, right? You went to question number two. Remember? Yeah. So yeah. what mistake did you make? Skipping the question. <laughs> that that that's very interesting. It's skipping the question. Now why did you why did you skip the question? I didn't have any idea about it. But now do you feel like you can do such questions? Or you're still kind of 50-50? Be honest. You don't have to say you've understood 100% when there's still some doubt. 50-50. That is if the question is twisted. Oh, so if the question is notorious, you might not get it right. So we're going to find out soon in your next attempt for next week's assignment. I'll get a similar question, if it's not already there, to give you to practice. Okay. Now we go to the second item. The resultant vectors. So, yes. any question concerning the manometer? Uh -huh. The formula remains just the same. The formula, is, changes, the, the formula is the same. The only thing they can ask you that, to trick you is if now the gas chamber is completely open, which would not make sense. But if they open the gas chamber, then the gas can also be affected by atmospheric pressure. You see, any open tube is going to be affected by atmospheric pressure. So, if supposing the side of the gas is not really gas, is another substance, for example, and we have mercury still on the same side. So, the side of the gas, we put another, another liquid. Then, in that case, atmospheric pressure cancels on the left hand side, and it also cancels on the right hand side because it's the same amount of pressure exerted when both sides are open i don't know if you captured that let me repeat assuming we have a case where let me let me see if i can uh, let's try something here let me draw something for you to see. Can you see the, the whiteboard I'm creating right here? Are you seeing the board, Martha? Yes, I'm seeing it. Okay, I'm going to sketch something here for emphasis. My hand is going to be a little bit shaky, but well, just the point, let's see. I'm sketching a YouTube. So we have that. It's not really perfect, but we're assuming that my YouTube is, is uniform. Huh? Not having the, let me try to make it uniform. Okay. Well, there you can clap for me. I really tried there. Martha is not clapping for me. Well, he say yay. Uh, yeah. Well, well, thank you. So here we have a substance on this side and another substance at that point. So this is oil. Then I'll have mercury. So it's 
let's change this to something better. Let's say this is mercury because it's much denser. We have mercury. M or HG if you like chemistry. There. Then on this other side, I'll have oil or liquid L. Then on this other side, I have another substance. So this one has dashes like that. This one has some small dots. And the one that is blank is mercury. So both of them are exposed to atmospheric pressure from above. This is atmospheric pressure. So if there's atmospheric pressure on this side, on the left-hand side, and there's atmospheric pressure on the right-hand side, then the effect cancels out. You remember seeing such type of manometers, correct? Where you're given a height, for example, for this side, and you're given the density for this other side. We have height h, and then we have the density rho. It's already given. And then on the other side, we can be given the height, which is h2. This is h1. Then you're told to find the density 2. We don't know what density 2 is. So it becomes a question mark. Do you remember doing such questions in class? Yeah, it's what the mind remembers. So if you don't, just say you don't. Yes, no? Where the formula that was being used is because we consider the same level, so for, we pick the level to be here, that point. So the pressure on this side, P1, is equal to the pressure on this other side, which you'll say is P2. Do you remember such a formula? You do. OK. So then we use P1 is rho 1, H1, G is equal to rho 2, H2, G. So here we don't include atmospheric pressure because it cancels on both sides. If you were to include it, it will still divide and it's read off in the calculation. Is this clear? Or it's complicated? It's not. Okay. Uh, nod if it is clear. Nod. Okay, good. So we go back to our presentation. Huh? Did you see the diagram, Martha? Nod if you saw it. Okay, good. Uh, now we go back to our presentation. The vectors. So for the vectors, you are told three forces. We have 12 newtons due east, 4 newtons due south, and 15 newtons due west. They were acting on a body. Then if the body was in equilibrium, find the resultant force. So equilibrium, equilibrium. What does that mean? Martha, what does it mean to be in equilibrium? Martha, can you hear me? Ah, good. Yes. What, what does it mean when we say a body is in equilibrium? Constant. Well, what is constant about it? Because constant means not changing, really. Uh, what, what does equilibrium mean? What equi comes from equal, yeah? and then we have librium, it's more about balance. 
So a body in equilibrium has is a body that is in a state of balance. When it's in a state of balance, in a way, we see that the body is at rest. Now, we're told that we have three forces. You can mute. We're told that we have three forces. One is 12 newtons due east, means towards east. And here, if you don't know your compass directions, well, it's going to change your answer. We have three forces. One is 12 newtons due east. So that is east, where my finger is pointing. Then we have four newtons due south. Ah, so south is downwards. And then we have 15 newtons due west. That other side. Then notice in my diagram, the arrows correspond to the size of the force. They correspond with actually the size of the force. So if the force is very big, then the arrow gets to be big. If the force is small, then the arrow gets to be small or short. Then you have to resolve the forces. We'll deal with the ones on the horizontal, the 15 newtons and the 12 newtons. So it's going to be 15 minus 12 because of the stronger side is that of 15. So we get 15 subtracting 12 and we have a balance of three. Then we have four newtons going down. So we've not really finished, that's just step one. Question is two marks. So the second step in our syllabus at the moment is in this question specifically is polite. Sometimes this question, you can be given angles. And when you're given angles, you are forced to use trigonometry. So right now we're only dealing with the magnitude of the force and we can use the triangle without the angles. So we have three newtons and four newtons. The one that is larger is obviously four newtons, but we cannot ignore three newtons. Four newtons would affect entirely a force that is above it directly on the opposite side. But we are not having such a force indicated. So we must build a triangle, a right angle triangle to be exact where we can either move the third, the three newtons or we can move the four newtons. Meaning we can either move the X axis, which is the, the three newtons to make the triangle, or we can move the Y axis, the four newtons to make the triangle. So in this case, which one did I move? Looking at my triangle the way it is, which one did I move? Did I move three newtons or did I move four newtons? Martha, to build this right angle triangle, what did I move? Four newtons. I moved the four newtons. Well, that, that's correct. It looks like I moved the four newtons because I dragged it from where it is to meet the three newtons. So I move the four newtons and someone else could also say, I move the three newtons from the left towards the right. And then it met the four newtons. So whether you moved the three newtons or the four newtons, you'd actually get the same triangle. Is that clear? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, good. Now, now that we have the triangle, notice that the arrows point the force towards a specific direction. From three, we move towards the left, then we're moving downwards to approach the direction of four newtons. Now, this is a special type of right angle triangle. Here, you would use Pythagoras theorem to solve it. Or you can just know using the special type of right angle triangle. If we have three on this side and we have four running down, then the hypotenuse becomes five. If you want to use Pythagoras theorem, then the square of three plus the square of four is going to give you the square of the hypotenuse. So we get nine plus 16, which is 25. And that is the square of five. So the root gives us five Newtons. So you simply use Pythagoras theorem. 
And then you have to draw the final diagram. This was stage one. The final diagram is where we have the resultant force lying between three newtons and four newtons. And it's our five newtons, where the arrow is slightly longer than four newtons. That is how we solve such a question. We have three, four, then the five. Why is it facing this side? Just like in our triangle, it is facing downwards, right? Somewhere between west and south. So that is where the arrow is. In most cases, you'll find in these diagrams, the force lies between the two of them. And if you want a specific angle, you would use trigonometry. So I have a question for you. But before I do, is it understood? Hello, Martha. Yes. So you're ready to try one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it says here, two forces. We have two forces, right? We have two forces and we have 300 newtons at zero degrees and 400 newtons at 90 degrees. 300 newtons at zero degrees and 400 newtons at 90 degrees. They pull on an object. Find the magnitude of the resultant force. This question is, is really something else, huh? They didn't even draw the diagram. How about that? But I think Martha can try because the you know, questions come the way they do. Even the first one, there was no diagram. You had to come up with the first diagram. Then you go to the second and third to help you figure things out. So I want you to try. Draw your diagram. Then you have two options. You can either send the image to my email, which you might find easier, or you can share your work here. Whichever method you use, I'll still be able to access your answer. Use the one that is easiest for you. Martha, can you hear me? Is it understood, the instruction? Yeah. So you can start right now to try it. I'm giving you about two minutes, two to three minutes, no pressure. Even if it takes slightly longer than that, since the objective is to understand, just keep on trying, unless you reach a stumbling block. Okay, you can mute, then you try. I'll be waiting on the other side. Yes, sir. I've already drawn the diagram. Okay, you think you can share? You don't know how to share? No. Oh, you can either 
take a photo with your phone and send it to me. Ah, see, I already have it. So we have your diagram here. That way at least we can... So you have... Can you see your own diagram? From my screen, can you see it? Yes. No. No, okay, how about now? Can you see it? Mm -hmm. So you have 300 newtons towards the left. Then 400 newtons. Why are you dag Why is the force bending like that? Usually straight lines, straight arrows. The arrows don't. They don't bend. 90 degrees. Oh, you had a problem with the angles. So let's see. Zero degrees is where the 300 is. That is right. And then 90 degrees yeah. is a vertical. 90 degrees is a vertical. It had to go up. So let's see how we can... We can come up with another one. So we have... Uh, your 300... Say it's like that. We have... The question as it demands, let's go back to the question to make sure we're doing the right thing. You're told you have two forces, 300 newtons at zero degrees, and then 400 newtons at 90 degrees. 300 newtons at zero. 400 newtons at, at 90. So this is your 300. at zero, this is your object, then 400 newtons at 90 degrees, a little bit longer, you'd have your 400 newtons. So this is the fast diagram, the fast sketch. So the object, then 300 newtons, is supposed to be a little bit shorter, let me make it a little bit shorter than four, they're not supposed to be longer, or the same size there so that's 300 and then the other one is 400 then you're supposed to use this diagram to come up with the results i'm giving you a second chance now that you have the diagram give me the resultants is that understood martha hello can you hear me martha yes i was saying uh-huh hello I can hear you. Just a minute, I pick someone. Okay. Then I return. Okay. Okay, so we're back in business. Good. So do you think you can do the same question? I mean, you, you redo the question and then you post your answer to my email. Okay, let me try. Okay. Use the diagram I have on, on your screen. Then give me the result. Okay.
Arthur, are you are you done? Yes, let me take a picture. Then send it to my email. I'll be there waiting. Check. Okay. Have you sent Martha? Not yet. Okay, my camera uh -huh. doesn't show pics that clear. That's why I'm taking long and taking the picture. It's okay, I understand. We're working with what we have, Martha. But thank you for explaining. Okay. Don't feel like you're under pressure. Just do what you can. And we're going to work with what there is. Okay. Yep, I already have it. Okay. So I want to rotate it using another app to see if it's going to write. So here we have it. Let me rotate. Ah. Uh, I'm not seeing it giving me the options to. to no, let this. me take another picture. No, 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 don't, don't. I can just save it on my machine and 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 rotate it. Actions.
In the meantime, try taking that photo because I'm not seeing the. Well, I usually use the same app to mark your peppers and I rotate it. Occasionally, not, not all the time. But I'm seeing. So is it toggled snap to greet? I already found it. It took me a while because I don't use it every day. I use it sometimes when I need it. So we are rotating it like this. Martha, can you see what I'm having on the screen? Then let me zoom out a bit. Martha? Martha? Hello? Yes, I'm back. OK, so here goes. We are going to see how you did the, the work. So we have 300 newtons. The R is on the left. Then we have 400. Don't forget that sign for the arrows. Because a force is a force is a vector quantity. Then, when you moved, when you're resolving the right angle triangle to get your answer, you got the 500, which is correct, 500. But the problem is, ah, uh, yes, it's right. I was, I thought you didn't finish the diagram, so it's down here. So it's right to that point. We're using Pythagoras theorem. Then you found the square root. That step is also correct. Then you went back to the object and you drew the 500 newtons. That step is also correct. Then always make the arrow to be a little bit longer because you see 500 newtons looks shorter compared to uh, 300 and 400, but that everything you did about it is right. It's just the arrows, which is a small part of, of, of uh, trying to fix. Otherwise, you're right. It's going to lie between. So you have your 500 newtons, something like that has to be longer than the two of them. Then you have your 500 newtons, as you did with the object. So that was very good. Yay! Martha, I can hear me clap for you, right? Yeah, thank you. So you've understood this. So let's go back to our... What do you see in that diagram? Is that something normal? If you have a balloon right now, is it going to go that high and remain there? In fact, I saw something like this. The same. And I was asking myself, how is it possible? Yeah, this balloon's a little bit crazy, yeah? Let's see what makes the balloons. Yeah, let, let's see what makes them too happy to go all the way up and just stick up there. So we have a, a link here. I want us to, to go to where this link is. Normally, I click the link and it goes, but I don't know why it's misbehaving. Like it's very well go online. So we going back to our link online. I think it's ready. Here it is. So we have a balloon. 
in notice. How many positives do we have? Martha, how many positives do we have? Four. And how many negatives? Yes, and how many negatives? Four also. Four. So what do we say is the state of this balloon? Is it positively charged? A. Is it negatively charged? B. Is it neutral? C. Or D, none of the above. Neutral. Carry. Very good. It's it's actually neutral. Because we have an equal balance of positive and negative. So look at what happens when I rub this balloon against this sweater. Ah, uh, what do you notice? Eh? What do you notice? The negatively charged from the sweaters are attached to the balloons. Excellent. Then look at the behavior of this balloon when I bring it close to the wall. Oh, here we are. What happens? Do you see that? Hmm? What is happening? Look at the balloon. I brought it close to the wall and look at the wall. It's repelling. What is repelling? Positive mm. or negative? Negative. The negatives are repelling each other. So what charge is on the balloon? Mm. Negative. Negative. And look at what happens to the balloon when I leave it in the air. In which direction is it moving? To the sweater. Why is that happening? It's attracting the positive charges from the sweater, attracting the negative charges from the balloon. That is why the balloon is sticking out to the sweater. So let's look at our yeah. wall. Or let me add one more balloon. Then, with my second balloon, I'm going to rub it against the sweater first, sorry. Then notice what happens when I bring it close to this other balloon. What happens? Hmm? What happens with the balloon when they're close to each other? Look at that. They're repelling. They're repelling. Why are they repelling? Because they're both negatively charged. They're both negatively charged. And what is happening to this other balloon? Notice. What is it happen happening to it when it's close to the wall? Attracting. So the green balloon is being attracted to the wall. So what have you learned from this simulation? Mm. What have we learned from it? The balloons, the new, the balloons uh -huh. can get charges from the surrounding. From the surrounding. And what happens when a balloon is rubbed with a piece of cloth? What charge does it get? It takes hmm? what part? When a balloon is rubbed with a piece of cloth, what charge does the balloon mm -hmm. have? Positive. Negative. So which is it? Negative. Negative, very good. You're actually smiling. I can hear you. I can hear you smile. There's in your voice I can hear you smile. Well, it's negative because, just as you're seeing right before your screen, we're having negative charges dominating in the yellow balloon and in the green balloon, and they were both rubbed against the sweater, which is a material or cloth. Now we go back to our, our work. So we have, when a balloon, is, a balloon is attracted to a ceiling or wall because it is negatively charged and it's going to attract the positive charges of the wall or the ceiling and repel the negative charges of the wall or the ceiling away. So that is exactly what happens or essentially what happens that makes a balloon stick up there because the ceiling has positive charges which are going to be attracted by the negative charges on the balloon, making it stick up there. And this particular lesson is that Manometer pressure always applies the concept of equal pressure at equal depths, that lower level, if you remember. And the pressure at a depth is dependent on the pressure due to the weight of the substance above it. 
sounds a little bit complicated when you see the word is. But what it means here is when you're considering pressure at a point due to a depth, always consider everything above that. For example, looking at our sheet here, if I create another one. If this is my tube and it has three different things inside and my depth is here where I have the dotted lines. So it's my straw. I have substance X, I have substance Y, and Z. So the pressure at this point, at that point, I'll call it P, is due to substance X, substance Y, and the height of substance Z. You must consider all of them. And one more thing, if it's a straw that is in open air, we'll also consider the weight of air, which is now atmospheric pressure. If it is a closed tube, we only deal with X, Y, and Z, this height. Call it height edge. Is that clear? This is for fluids, where we use rho, H, and G. When you're looking at pressure at that level, that's the level, then we must consider all the substances, the weight of all these substances above, their height. So we must consider the height of Z, the height of Y, the height of X. We will use the density of Z with the corresponding height, the Y, the height with its corresponding density, x with its corresponding density, meaning all the three substances matter. And if it is open, then we also include the air pressure or the atmospheric pressure. Then, lastly, in electrostatics, the electrons are mobile and not the protons. The protons are usually very deep embedded in an atom. It would use a lot of energy to prize them out away from where they are. So what we consider is the electrons, the ones that are mobile, moving. And it's on the surface that we consider because there's a difference between electrostatics and electricity. Is this clear, Martha? Yes. So these charges are on the surface. They're not the ones passing through a material that is a conductor. When the charges, the electrons are passing through, that becomes electricity. But these charges are said to be static, they're not really moving. They settle on the material and they're on the surface. So electrostatics, uh, the study of charges which are at rest or stationary, we consider the electrons and not the protons to be the ones uh, moving on the surface of the body. And I end there, unless you have questions from me, the lesson has come to an end for today. We've done a lot. Despite the time, I'm glad we've done a lot. Yeah. Okay. So, any question or I release you? No question. No question. Okay, Martha, well, have a good time. And make something delightful. Yeah. You too. Happy Uduma Day and World Mental Health Day. Awesome. Okay, Martha, you're free to go. Okay. Thank you. You're most welcome. It's been lovely. Yeah.